Welcome to this ODI Futures event on data infrastructure for finance. My name is Sarandi, I'm from Thomson Reuters, and we're here today in our lovely offices in Canary Wharf, the global hub of the financial world. When we think about infrastructure, we often think about roads, bridges, and power grids. But today, it's data that underpins so many of our everyday activities. Data was used to guide your journey here today. Uh, you must have used Google Maps to plan your walk here, or you might have used a DLR, uh, which uses di driverless trains, for example. It will be used to decide whether you're capable of paying a mortgage, or whether you're at risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, or whether you do indeed have the democratic right to vote. I think we often forget how much of our lives and businesses depend on data. After all, effective infrastructures are invisible. We only remember them when they stop working as they should. For example, when your train is three minutes late or when the lights don't turn on. Or that special moment when you've switched to paperless bank statements and yet every official process requires you to pin them out on paper and hand them over ceremoniously so they can then scan and digitize them for their own purpose. I think we all recognize now that data is a form of infrastructure and we must give it the attention that it requires. And in this conversation about data infrastructure, we often lump together two subtly different concepts. First, data as infrastructure, so the data itself, for example, geographical coordinates, and then the processes and systems through which data is created and through which data flows. But like trains and railway tracks, they all form part of the same infrastructure, and one is much more useful when there's an abundance of the other. The financial community is a far-reaching one. We have actors and participants from consumers and banks to investors and regulators. Everyone needs to share and use data. So what is the data infrastructure that we need for a better, more effective, more inclusive and open financial system? Today, we're going to hear from participants from across the financial landscape on technologies that they're working on and on their thoughts for the future of finance. We encourage you to share your thoughts on social media. Please use the hashtag ODI Futures um, so that everyone else can join in as well. As we all know, one of the emerging technologies in this space is blockchain. It's gathered a lot of attention. To talk more about the application of blockchain to data infrastructure, please welcome the head of ODI Labs, James Smith. It's, uh, it's great to see uh, you here for this ODI Futures event. Uh, we've been uh, putting this together for a while, so it's lovely to see everyone here on stage and uh, it really happening. So, um, yeah, I'm here to announce uh, the launch of a report that we've just uh, finished um, in ODI Labs, which you will all have a copy of uh, on your chair. And that is our report about applying blockchain technology in global data infrastructure. And uh, you have a copy there, but you can also download a copy on the website. Um, this is a report that's really aimed at non-technical audiences. There is a lot of hype around blockchains. There, there is a lot of um, differing sort of forms of information. So whether it's people getting you know, very excited about the possibilities or looking at the, the details, we're trying to cover that range for a non-technical audience who are interested in how it might impact them in either a commercial or policy context. Um, and we've done that by looking at, uh, looking at a range of things in the report. Uh, we look at the basics of the technology, that's hopefully a very clear primer on what the technology is, what it means, what it can and what it can't do. Um, we've looked at the landscape of things that are being developed using the technology and the technologies that are emerging. Um, so what startups are doing, what's being built with the technology, what platforms are emerging and so on, and identified a few trends in there. Um, and we've looked at a lot of the issues, the potential issues around the technology. One of the uh, unique aspects of, of blockchains is that uh, the immutability of the, uh, of the data that's put into them makes it very hard to, and, and the openness as well, makes it very hard to roll back uh, problems. So we have to think a little bit upfront about what we want to do with them, how we want to use them, especially when it comes to uh, things like personal data. So we look at how uh, the blockchain applications for data infrastructure will scale over time, how these things can be linked together into a linked global data infrastructure, what the issues that we need to be careful of when we're looking at 
putting personal information into these kinds of systems, whether it's a blockchain, whether it's other distributed systems, whether it's a hybrid of those two, what do we need to consider? Um, because the consequences of doing it wrong will be, could be painful. So we, we want to make sure that we, uh, that we don't do that. And lastly, the, uh, the labs team in the ODI, um, the software team, have looked at some practical experimentation. So really trying to use um, a blockchain to do some... Uh, to do some form of data collaboration, data publishing. And we've built a system that takes existing open data, puts it into a blockchain system to make it auditable, to make it immutable, to make it trackable over time. And then use that to work out what are the other issues then, what's the next step after you've said, okay, let's put this in a blockchain. What are we going to look at next? We're going to have to look at search. We're going to have to look at um, how we incentivize people to, uh, to do these things. So. That's the kind of thing that the report covers. Um, please have a read through. There are some uh, sort of core recommendations um, or core findings out of the report that we think are the, the ones really to, to focus on. Distributed ledgers, blockchains are a really, potentially really important area of technology. They're not a magic bullet. They won't solve all the problems purely because they are a nice new technology. But they are important, they are interesting. We need to keep researching, we need to keep looking into what the applications are. But at the same time, we have to avoid being swept up by the hype. Um, there is a lot of it out there. All technologies go through this, uh, this process of being overhyped. Then you know, everybody gets very disillusioned. And then eventually, we arrive at the useful solutions. We want to get to those useful solutions as soon as possible. As with all technologies, with new technologies, we have to remember to focus on what the actual problem is that we're trying to solve. There are a lot of startups, a lot of uh, experiments out there that are going, we have a blockchain, what can we apply to it? What can we apply it to, rather? Rather than going, we have a problem, what technology do we need in order to solve it? So it's always best to focus on using these first and then choose the technology. I urge you all to have a look. You all have a copy. Um, so please take it away, have a read. Let us know what you think. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope it's the first step in an ongoing conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, James. And that report is available on the ODI website as well. We've invited a range of speakers today uh, to talk a bit about their company's technologies for and research on data infrastructure for finance. After each talk, there'll be a few minutes for Q&A as well. So to kick us off, please welcome my colleague from Thomson Reuters, Jeff Horrell. Great to be here. Thanks to the ODI for, for organizing this. It's great to organize something where I, I literally have to travel a few floors in the elevator to get here, so I didn't use much data uh, to get here. I want to talk about the, some of the experiences that we've had at Thomson Reuters working with the ODI and working with our clients uh, in a particularly kind of challenging area for the financial sector, which is managing uh, unstructured data. It's a very familiar, very old story. Our clients' companies are awash with unstructured data. Uh, and there's an explosion in the volume uh, of that content. It's not a new problem, but it's one that's there. It's been accelerating for a long time. It's something that several uh, industries have tackled, uh, but the financial industry is only really now starting to really uh, try to uh, tackle this. The technology has become much more uh, freely available to actually store and manage this data. As we go around and, and talk to our clients, they tell us they have big data projects uh, going on within their firms. Uh, they're collecting and they're storing uh, huge amounts of, of data. It could be research, their emails, their uh, regulatory filings, other data sets. But it just doesn't actually connect uh, with the rest of the data in their organization. They have lot, they've just created larger, bigger silos of data that they have less ability to, to kind of get information out of. So that's a bit of a challenge, a bit of a problem. Thomson Reuters actually works with a lot of that similar kind of content. Uh, but because we're really a, a data company at heart, uh, we've been working on well, what's the model for understanding and connecting that data? How do you, want, how do you organize and manage that type of data? Um, how do I add tags and values and structure and organization uh, to, that, to that information? That's a very different type of approach than some of the traditional financial data around instruments, around prices, around exchange type content, where there's a lot of very good standards and a lot of very structured 
processes around that. Um, but our breadth and depth of, of information that we manage at, at TR means we have to kind of go, go beyond that. So that's an interesting um, piece of work that we've been doing over, over the last many years. How does that relate to, um, to unstructured data? Well, we actually acquired a company uh, many years ago that focused on unstructured data. And it helps you bring in a model, uh, topic tagging, information tagging, entity extraction out of unstructured data. Obviously started using natural language processing, uses a lot, whole range and suite of, of machine learning um, techniques. And we made this actually available to the open community uh, quite a long time ago, 2008, we had a kind of free version of this. But the community was really based around a sort of enthusiasts and people who are, who are experts in that area. It didn't really make the crossover into the, the financial space. And when we went out and we talked to clients, they said, well, we have this unstructured data problem. We know you have some of the tools that could help us, but we really need something that will help us connect our identifiers and your identifiers and this model together. And they also said, we don't really want to be locked into any particular vendor uh, infrastructure. You know, we've kind of gone down that road many times before. We really want something that is much more open. And we had a lot of consultation with our clients, and actually we worked very closely with uh, the Open Data Institute, and came up with a way to really try and resolve this. And we basically made our topics, our tagging, our uh, the concepts uh, that we were using to uh, make sense of that unstructured data, we made those open. Uh, and we launched our open, uh, what we call our open PermID program. And we also relaunched our our tagging engine now called Thomson Reuters Intelligent Tagging. And we're now seeing major large-scale adoption of that facility because we had the tool, we now have the uh, open data as well as part of that, and it's becoming much more uh, widely adopted. So um, just sort of recap what I, what I said. So the, the customer challenge was, you know, there's not a universal set of identifiers or infrastructures to manage uh, this type of data. Um, it's really fragmented internally within their firms. And the clients have always had to create their own internal identifiers. Just because there's not a standard doesn't mean people don't work with the data, they create all their own internal systems. And it's really expensive to try and manage all of that. Um, and it doesn't still interoperate with the rest of the market. It might interoperate with your data, but it won't help you connect with your, with your customers' data. So what we've done is, as I just mentioned, we've, we've open licensed our uh, identifiers which go you know, far beyond the traditional instrument identifiers, but organizations and people, funds, issuers, topics, uh, concepts, and so on. So the identity of those things is open and, and can be shared. The technology, the intelligent tagging technology, is not open and shared. You have to buy that. We are a commercial company. We do ask you to buy some products. So our strategic solution puts that together, a commercial model that makes sense for us, and an open data model that, that helps client adoption. And so we help people with people to kind of uh, combine that together. This is the, the permid.org uh, site. We took a lot of advice and input from the ODI on how to, what the best practice it was around uh, licensing, around standards, around how to um, communicate those standards, how to make it easy for general purpose adoption. Uh, and we've seen massive adoption um, of the open permid site. There's a number of adoption tools on there. Um, for all kinds of different projects. And you can go on there, it's permid.org. Uh, you can go on there, you can take a look at the data that's there, you can use some of the adoption tools, there's APIs, there's bulk, bulk download capabilities. There's also some free tagging services on there to give you a sense of how that and structured data can be brought, brought together. So put it together, we have this nice little uh, graphic that sort of shows the, the fire hose of data coming in all these different sources. And we have clients doing this today with emails, with blogs, with internal research, with uh, filings, all kinds of content, um, adding their tags to it, as I just said, spitting it out and connecting it with the rest of their infrastructure, which they've made a huge investment in. It may not be on the big data environment. It may just be a traditional financial infrastructure, but this allows them to connect that more effectively um, together. So I guess I'll, I'll take questions. Hi, thank you for the talk. Um, I was just wondering, could you give an example of the kind of actions and insights that have come out of this, the, the, the type of things that this is used for 
in sort of specific use cases? So the, the types of things that were used for the intelligent tagging? Yeah. Yeah. Financial firms are, uh, can be quite fragmented internally, different silos. So you may have a team that is putting together a lot of internal research, or perhaps you know, they've, they've gone and done a lot of management meetings, and they've put that information together, and it's on a SharePoint system or it's in their internal research uh, site. When we run intelligent tagging across that, it will then pull out those tags. Who did they meet with? What firm did they meet with? What was the topic? Were they positive or negative about that, that, um, that meeting or in that research? And then when other users in the firm are searching for that content, they're basically able to find it. So you have um, uh, you know, a whole range of, of other, other internal documents. You run intelligent tagging across it, and you want to know, you know, am I doing business with a company in Iran or a company that has a connection to Iran, for example? Any mention of that country or geography or um, topic uh, will have been automatically extracted and identified. And that can then be connected to you know, a permanent identifier for that country or that topic. And then so when th that risk or compliance officer is looking for that information, um, they don't have to sift through uh, a lot of documents. And they're not relying on kind of free text search to find those things. It's much more, it's much more precise a connection. Um, so we see two things, one on the kind of information sharing, sort of a risk identification, but also on, on, on sort of finding opportunities. So when, when data is more fragmented, um, intelligent tagging helps uh, with that solution. So you see Ed in this here, who, uh, from Tom Strauss, who can tell you more about intelligent tagging in the audience there as well. Any questions? Yes. So, this is the question was, what's the scale yeah. um, of this? So, we are tagging um, to, uh, well, in terms of input volumes of documents, it doesn't, you know, a client, a typical client will, whatever the size of database they have, there's no actually limit on that, or the capability uh, can absorb however many documents they want. You just set up different instances to process that, that extra content. In terms of the breadth of tagging, uh, we have certain topics, we have sort of five and a half million organizations, we have five and a half million people that we'll tag it to. And our precision of the tagging to those organizations of people is, you know, varies across, across that universe. We have events that we tag, so if there's a, a corporate action or an earnings announcement or a restructuring, those, con those types of concepts, we recognize those as events and we'll output those as, as tags. So, I can't remember off the top of my head how many different types of tags, but it's, it's a limit, you know, it's a large set, but it's a limited set. Um, I think the next thing we'd like to do in the future is how can we enable people to create their own tags um, and do that. And we are doing some work connecting with some open repositories of sort of semantic tags, right? So, if somebody has a, a set of taxonomies around social tags for you know, what's trending or something. We'd like to better bring those in and have people use those. Uh, but at the moment, it's a set of tags that we use internally at Thompson Reuters, so it's, it's relevant more for the, for the financial sector. Um, so if you want you know, healthcare tags, we wouldn't have those. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, thank you. So from data tagging now on to credit scores, please welcome Andy Wills from Experian. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Andy. Um, I work for Experian. Um, hopefully, if some of you know who Experian are. Uh, most people think of us as a credit reference agency, and we definitely do that. Um, but we also operate um, in a number of different areas as well. We have a long history of big data management, analytics, insight, payments processing, fraud and ID, a whole series of things in the space of data management covering individuals and organizations. And, and when we think about our organization, we think that the kind of core to our organization is around connecting individuals and organizations um, and helping organizations connect and understand each other and people to connect and understand each other. Um, I think we probably all saw in the news yesterday um, the news about Microsoft buying LinkedIn. Um, which I think was around about $26 billion. Um, I think that is an indicator of the value of data. Um, clearly, not all of that $26 billion is um, attached to the data that LinkedIn hold. They have functionality, clearly. But those, 
that data on people and organizations around the globe is very, very powerful and, and, and very valuable to an organization like Microsoft. Um, I'm going to talk about something called XPIN, um, which is a technology that we have developed and continue to develop to, to match data. We've started in the, um, we describe it the consumer space, but that means data about individuals as opposed to data about organizations. I think we are all absolutely familiar with the digital data explosion that has occurred over the, the last five to 10 years. Um, and it, it's becoming, the way the economy operates is becoming increasingly digitized, increasingly sophisticated, and that is unlikely to stop. But what we see is that that, that is presenting real challenges for organizations to identify individuals and to connect to them because there is no single mechanism for identifying an individual. Um, Jeff talked about this in his presentation, but there are multiple identifiers of an individual. Right at the core of how we approach it are um, data assets as similar as, as a simple as, sorry, name, address, date of birth, but I'm sure you're probably all aware if you were um, operating the data space, just how many different variants of address can be achieved by organizations and individuals, um, let alone names, date of birth not quite so problematic. But when you start to attach to that other structured data like telephone numbers, mobile numbers, email accounts, and so on and so forth, that proliferation becomes a real challenge. Um, we think it would be great if there were a unique and persistent identifier. Um, I think we recognize it's unlikely to, there is unlikely to be one single identifier that would be adopted by all organizations forever, but we think there is a place for um, an improved identifier for both individuals and in time, organizations going forward. There are clearly some identifiers that exist today um, in the individual space, national insurance number um, is often discussed as, as a unique identifier, but it has some problems. There, through the history of the issue of national insurance numbers, there have been um, uh, overlaps in issuing, so there's duplications within that, that data set, and, and it, it tends not to be particularly um, well used by individuals. Um, Facebook, um, a proportion of the, 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 um, the country and, and, and globally, people use Facebook, but clearly not all. Apple ID, similar. So there are, there are things out there that are being used as identifiers um, with different degrees of trust and veracity behind them, but, but nothing that is comprehensive that covers all things. Um, so I'm coming around to what has Experian done. And what we see is with our clients, so a lot of our organization is B2B, but it's around the use of consumer data. We, we, we see the challenge that this lack of a single identifier creates is particularly within financial services organizations, particularly within banks and insurance companies. We see um, uh, a real challenge for organizations to have a single view of their customer. Many of those organizations have been very account centric for a long time. I was previously with Barclays before coming to Experian um, and they for a long time organized their business on an account on a product basis and um, it was a real challenge to identify um, who, the, who the customer was and how many customers they had and many other organizations are like that and that drives great deals in efficiency within the organization trying to understand who the individual is. So what, what has Experian done? Um, uh, I don't have any moving graphics in my um, visual, but in essence, XPIN is a mechanism for taking a large amount of data in, um, in the top, putting it through the, the engine, the, the logic that we've built, the ag algorithms we have built to do data matching, and create at the end a simple 10-digit numeric identifier that we call XPIN, Experian personal identification number. Um, now, in of itself, that doesn't sound particularly radical, but what we do is we persist that pin over time, 
We update it all the while with new data that's coming in, um, and the, the, the sophistication and complication around matching, merging, separating is part of the kind of the proprietary logic that we developed over a number of years. So how is it made? We, we process around about 650 million data items every single month. And we know where they come from, and we know who they come from, and we understand the pros and cons with that data. We have um, well-established and sophisticated data quality routines, um, and we run those continuously. Um, so things as simple as postcode. Um, anybody who's involved in addresses know that postcodes change periodically. Sometimes new postcode regions are created. There's always a new housing development with new postcodes. Um, so something that ostensibly looks static is actually dynamic. And so just running an algorithm around postcode changes continuously means that we can enhance matching of an individual. Data standardization, I talked about names and addresses and, and date of birth as well. Um, there are numerous different ways of um, spelling names or configuring names and addresses and so on and so forth. And so we, again, we use some of our own software, but also some purchase software to standardize, to enhance matching. So XPIN is a 10-digit numeric code attached to an individual where we're continuously updating data about that individual. Um, we make it available to clients um, and consumers um, in real time or in batch. So it can be called through the, the, the database that we've got and through API technology. Um, it's made available through individuals through our own products and, and, and progressively as the economy um, gets more sophisticated through partners to allow individuals to look at and interrogate their data. As I said, it's dynamically updated, standardized, and, and you know, I, I go back to that point around data provenance. We, we know where the data comes from. We know it's not always perfect, but we understand those challenges and can, can work with those. The coverage, I think, is, is really very important. Um, we, we have coverage of around about 50 million adults. Um, typically, we start to get data from around about the age of 15 or 16. Um, and typically, just because of the way the economy has developed, people who are um, late 60s, early 70s onwards tend to be less active, so we have less data. But in that big section in the middle, 16, 17 through to middle late 60s, we have a lot of data, and clearly as people age, that age limit at the top end will continue to push up. So we're expecting that number to go up, and, and, and pretty good data, and we can attach that to around about 23 million addresses. So we think that's good coverage. I haven't really talked about kind of making it open, um, like Thomson Reuters, Experian is a commercial organization. In a lot of ways, our business model has been around control of data for commercial advantage. But we also, even though we charge for it, we make that data available to as many clients who pay us to access the data, and progressively to as many individuals who want to see their data. And I think that trend is only going to continue. Uh, we certainly see the empowerment of consumer, the empowerment of individuals, the governmental and regulatory and Open Data Institute type um, thinking moving towards more and more individuals having access to their data, having influence and having control over their data. And we think we have a, a role to play. In terms of XPIN, we, we want to make it available to organisations who want to connect to people and in phase two who want to connect to other organisations. Um, at the minute, we're still thinking that will be on a commercial basis, but there are potentially sectors or even certain organisations where that might be made on, on a free of charge basis for a period of time to get them started. So, you know, there, there are lots of fintechs out there who perhaps if they can have access for 18 months, two years, to get started, to do some initial research, would be a very, very good thing to do. And that might be beneficial for us as, as an organisation as well. So just some organisations that we're working with who are using XPIN today, 
Um, there are a couple of financial organisations there, so Amex, Tesco Bank, obviously, um, but we see it in utilities, we see it in telco, and we use, XP, uh, we use XPIN within our business to power our credit bureau. And we are a key part of the financial services industry. We, we, we clearly support a great number of financial services organisations through data provision and identity, etc. Et thank you, Andy. OK, thank you. Next, we're going to shift our focus a little bit to regulatory data. Please welcome Diana Paradis from Sway. Hi, everybody, and uh, very happy to be here. Um, so what I wanted to, to cover, I'll tell you a bit more about what we do as a company, uh, but more importantly, what we do uh, as part of one of the Odine companies and uh, the FIRE data format, which is basically financial regulatory data format uh, that is an open source project um, that we are working on. How do we prevent the next financial crisis? So we're one of the rec tech companies in London, that's our ethos, and this is something that we believe very strongly, um, is that the only way forward is regulation. And this is something that I have presented at Parliament, at Number 10, um, across the industry, and you know, even to, to regulators. And what's been wonderful is that the industry also is embracing the reality that regulation is something that you know, is the only way forward and that it needs to be embraced. The way that the systems and technology in banking used to work uh, pre-crisis, uh, it was a very one-dimensional model. And that was fine, it worked um, for you know, the pre-Basel III era. Uh, but what we have found since the regulation has uh, started to increase um, copiously is that we have needed more and more um, you know, integration and more and more systems talking to each other. And this is really how the banking industry looks at the moment uh, with this spaghetti code that everyone knows about, um, which is a bit, bit dramatic when you try to do anything innovative. What we believe in is that really the future and the way to embrace regulation is to put the regulator at the very core of it and what the regulation is trying to do at the core of it. And this is really where we have been making a difference, um, effectively understanding how to create good IT for regulation. What we have also realized is that the financial industry, not just because of regulatory reasons, but just in general, needs to become more and more interconnected. So there's also things, not just that the regulators are expecting, but that the customers are expecting, that you know, the wider sector uh, is expecting from the financial industry. And so what that means is even more uh, interconnectedness. And trends in the regulation um, and what we have have seen from our clients as well is that the data, so big data is obviously a huge topic and the complexity keeps only growing. Uh, you need much more ability to frequently change and update the technology as the regulation changes and you need something that becomes a lot cheaper as well as transparent for, for the whole industry. What we realized very quickly as part of our adventures is that what the industry really was yearning for, not just from the banks or from our clients or the financial industry, but also the fintechs and regulators uh, and the public was standing. So it's something that you know we have been speaking about already in the last two, two talks. But the reality is that everyone around us was really yearning for these standards, and we decided to think about it the same way you know that Google would do. So the nice thing about being a young company is that it can be very flexible and innovative in whatever way we think is right. And uh, when you think about what Google would do with a problem like this, is that you know the same thing that basically we took the example that they, they you know on how they worked around their transport standard and what that has allowed, which is very powerful. Um, effectively allowing a whole ecosystem of innovation and of apps and of different things that can be built thanks to the standards that Google put out in the industry. When you think even of the standards that Google built, so the whole financial industry is built on standards upon standards. And uh, this, for example, are you know, your typical web uh, standards and they are reused as part of the everyday work uh, from you know, coders across the industry. And in finance in particular, you actually are, you know, people are very familiar with the work of SWIFT, um, different things that we have seen in FIX and uh, FPML. So these are all great examples of standards that have been very useful for the industry and that continue to be used. Uh, and you can see you know, the oldest one is 1973, and it's still the standard that we're using nowadays. So the nice thing about standards is that once they're set up, things can really change forever, and that's where we're coming from. So what is a good standard? So a good standard does not try to reinvent the wheel. Uh, our approach is very much about taking regulatory definitions that are out there already uh, and different things that are out there in the industry that are seeing and recognize the standards and to work with that as part of the open source project that we're putting out. Um, it is not a competitive advantage, so one of the reasons why uh, we've had so much success in what we've been doing is because the banks themselves don't really see this as a competitive advantage. And so it's really a situation where collaboration and good collaboration for something like this can really allow 
even better competition in the longer term for the people that are getting involved with it. And a good way to start with for a standard is actually the rules, the law. So that's why we start with regulation. So from our perspective, so it's a plain text JSON, so it's not a database model, so it can be reused uh, quite easily. It has a clear purpose. Uh, so it's the data needed to meet your regulatory requirements. And, um, you know, when it comes from, you know, it's an open source project, so it's, you know, it has an Apache license. Uh, the support that we've had from the community, so obviously Odyne is something that has been fantastic for us to really look at resources and focus resources on producing this. Um, but the reality is that when you think about, so we call it fire data format, so financial regulation data format, um, the reality is that this kind of approach really allows all sorts of contributions from banks that don't necessarily want to um, open up their data to the industry but can do it through a neutral platform like ourselves, or even fintechs. So one of the things that's been quite interesting in the, in the fintech movement is that people have been asking, and the fintechs have been asking a lot for, uh, you know, dummy data from the banks to be able to do more and to create apps and to create all sorts of innovation. The problem with dummy data is that if you get dummy data from one bank versus another, it's absolutely redundant to actually produce innovation. So the approach with having a standard around this is that you can actually produce your own dummy data and do all sorts of stuff with it. Uh, so our fintech, uh, you know, community has also been very happy with using some of these standards to produce more and more innovation. The FIRE objectives is obviously driven by improving regulatory data, uh, but it is very much about you know, bringing more quality control and governance when it comes to definitions. Uh, there's a lot of definitions that are out there, uh, in particular coming from the law and the regulators, and it is about translating that into something that can be useful for coders, um, and that's kind of our approach with it. Uh, and what this also allows is more comparability, and it's something that can actually even help from a supervisory perspective, comparability between banks and different players. Um, and it's also about trying to get this seamless integration that can allow more innovation in the industry uh, and more interaction with third parties. So this is very much about a more transparent and stable and cheaper financial industry for the consumer as well. So how to contribute, this is the, the details of our GitHub page and you can go through it uh, through our website. And um, you will find a file that is for the code and then a file for documentation that has a very transparent approach of putting out there the regulatory data definitions and the regulatory coding that can be reused for the industry. I think that's it. And you guys are, you know, anyone that can contribute, very, very welcome to contribute as well. Uh, and I don't know if that's seven minutes or... Yeah, no, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Next up, well, my favorite topic of them all, diamonds. Please welcome Calogero Shiveta from Everledger. Hi everyone, thank you for having us, thank you for uh, having me today. The, the problem we try to solve at Everledger is the problem of provenance. And when you think about what provenance means, it's an history of an item, where it comes from, where it goes, who owns it, who trade it, who bought it, and where is it now. And when you think about luxury goods, such as diamond, watches, art, and jewelry, Provenance matters because provenance is deeply linked to the value of the object itself. So you can't separate the history of the item and its ownership to its value. But the main problem of provenance today is that provenance is locked into paper. Think about a purchase you made, you go to a store, you get a receipt, you get a certificate of authenticity, you, fold, you hold it somewhere, maybe you move and you lose it. And when you lose, this provenance is broken, and when provenance is broken, a new word arises. And this word is risk. Risk is at the base of the largest black, uh, black markets we face today. The first one is theft. You probably heard the story about uh, last year, uh, spring, in Hudson Garden, where 200 million worth of diamonds, cash, watches were stolen. And people were doing that because they knew they knew that without provenance, these items could be easily store, uh, sold or stolen. The second one is fraud. So fraud is a huge uh, problem emerging uh, with the increasing of cyber, um, cyber crime. But also think about the way companies trade today. When you think about uh, supply chain, um, there is a lot of fraud, document tampering in the ways companies do commerce between each other, but also on a personal level. What stopped me to call my insurer and say that an item was lost or stolen, except that it didn't, just wait a few months and then sell it to the next person? Hack is a reality today. So there's this famous quote that everyone has been hacked except you don't know yet. 
So all the repository of those data are hacked constantly. And this, you know, have an impact on the commerce, on budget of companies, but also on the way people trade and how uh, digital uh, economy grow. So in order to solve those problems, we created Everledger. Everledger is simply a digital global ledger that track and protect items of value. In order to do so, we use the blockchain. So blockchain is a distributed uh, ledger that allow multiple uh, companies and actors in the value chain to interact with themselves. So we use them for uh, four main reasons. So first of all, it's immutability. James allowed to touch this very briefly. So in the blockchain, there is, the records are permanent and cannot be changed. So you can't go backwards on a transaction. The second one is secure. So it's a distributed database. Uh, with a double cryptographic signature, so that allow a new level of security that hasn't been reached before. The third is fast. So once an information comes into our system, it's distributed across all the networks, so all the parties have the right information at the right time. And then it's scalable. So there is no limit on the information you can store in the blockchain and you can attach to any single transactions. So we started with diamonds, and I'll show you a little, very quickly what we did. So we started to create relationship with the major certification houses in the world, so in New York, in Belgium, in India, in China, where they grade and certify all the diamonds. So we take not only the four Cs, so carrot, color, grade, and so on, but we take 40 metadata of every single stone, and we create a digital thumbprint of these diamonds. So we take all those information and we store it into the blockchain. So as, uh, as soon as we do that, we're able to track if an item, for instance, is sold or is sold online, or, in, or if it's stolen, and if it's submitted to another claim. So we share this information with insurance companies, with online retailer, with, of course, um, uh, government agencies, to make sure that we know where diamonds that are alleged cross board and uh, between, between states. So we have the history of all the transaction about the ownership, but also about who owns that diamond. Because a diamond's changed hands multiple times during its process. We are one year old as a company, so we were born here in London. Uh, we were part of the Barclays Accelerator on the batch in 2015. We work with Allianz in their accelerator in France, because we are all, of course, as you can imagine, very interesting in working with insurance company on luxury items as well. So we work with companies like Allianz, Aviva, with the digital garage, so we have access to uh, some of the most brilliant minds in insurance work with Barclays, uh, both here in the UK but also in Africa, where most of the diamonds are mined today. And with BBVA, we have almost one million diamonds in uh, in our platform that can be searchable, and we create a, plat a smart contract platform. So smart contracts are you know, a way to uh, create autonomous contract between parties that execute their sales very well. What's interesting about the diamond industry is that you have two separate streams, so the ownership of the diamonds, but also the custody. So the supply chain of diamonds is, of course, global by nature. So most of the diamonds are um, uh, mined in Africa, you know, the, the cutting and polish operation are mostly in India, trading is done in Europe, and clients are worldwide. So it's important for us to track also the custody of the diamonds and understand where those stones are. And also, of course, for recovery. So as I mentioned before, insurance work with us to understand if uh, when they insure diamonds, you know, there is no claim attached to it or if there is not already an insurance policy attached to it. We started with the diamonds, uh, but our vision is a little bit broader than that. So we're work we are working towards jewelry and fine arts as well. So we want to understand how, we, uh, how to solve the forgery problem. Luxury goods, where counterfeit is um, 1.7 trillion market worldwide. Uh, ethical sourcing, because our aim is to link the ethical sourcing with the financial incentive of companies. So there are been uh, recently some initiative also from the UK government with the Anti-Slavery Act. There is uh, more and more demand, both from a consumer but from a company point of view, on understanding and gain more visibility on the supply chain. Uh, and we think that ethical, ethical sourcing is uh, a competitive advantage. And then extinction. Extinction is the fourth biggest black market in the world. And uh, so when you think about Tusk, when you think about Rhino Tusk, Elephant Tusk, is the fourth largest, biggest market in the world. And some, some of, most of those items 
because of the value and uh, the transportability they have, are mostly used for money laundering and uh, ter uh, terrorist funded activity. So there is a strong belief in you know, reducing this type of fraud, reducing this type of, this type of commerce, and making sure that uh, we can trade uh, legitimate items on a legitimate way. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions for Kaljan? Here. Thanks very much. It was very enlightening. Can I just ask you, how do you collect all the metadata from the diamond? What's the process? Yeah, sure. When a certificate is created by certification houses, so we have a connection on an, on an, on an API, so we collect the information as, as soon as the, a, new, a new certificate is, uh, is created. So we gather the information directly from the certification houses. And then we are also adding a layer of uh, hyper-definition photography where we are able to take a picture of the diamond from the top of the crown to make sure that we get uh, data around the inclusion and some of the metadata from the stone itself. If, if you think about, uh, you have a digital thumbprint which is like a passport, and then you have a picture which is like a facial recognition of the diamonds. Because one of the largest problems in the industry today is uh, synthetic stones. So synthetic stones reach the gem quality level, so they are swapped in the pipeline. So we need to make sure that we're able to identify not only the certification, but also the asset itself. So we uh, closely work with Ethereum. So it's, mm, we know we know we know that organization, of course, you know, provenance and supply chain has been one of the most uh, uh, prolific in terms of initiative area on the blockchain itself. Because of yeah, we partner with them in the sense that we use some of our technology is based on Ethereum as well. So you know we are in contact with them. Thanks, you. are welcome. Thank you. half of the program is Peter Wells from the ODI. Hi. Uh, hello. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here. Hope you're, having fun. <coughs> hope you're having fun. I'm from the Open Data Institute. I want to talk about building financial data infrastructure through open banking. So just going back to what Tarindi said when she started us off. Uh, she said data is infrastructure. It is. And we say data is infrastructure. It's infrastructure just like roads. That's the closest analogy we find. Roads help us navigate to a location. Data helps us make a decision. In the Industrial Revolution, we learned how to build better roads. You know, we, we didn't have really good ones at first, but we learned how to build better roads. Nowadays, we can call it the Digital Revolution. We need to learn how to build better data infrastructure. It's a key focus of ourselves at the Open Data Institute. And the data in that infrastructure comes from across the, what we call the data spectrum, closed, shared, and open data. Closed data, which we're keeping private, you know, shared data which we're sharing with other people to get a service. We might share it with a doctor, but maybe we share it for a commercial need. So we, we do that in a shared model. And open data, data anyone can use for any purpose. We put it on the data spectrum. There's a big one up on the wall over there. We carry it around with us to places under our arms and put post-it notes on it. You know, get people to think about where their data should be. But one of the things we find is that when we talk about these things, lots of people, we just talk about the data sometimes, and we focus a lot on the data. But when we think about roads, and our road infrastructure, it's not just about the roads. It's about the organisations that planned where the road is. It's the organisations that fill potholes in when potholes appear. It's the highway code that tells us the rules of the road and how we're supposed to use it. And it's the same for data infrastructure. So as well as the data assets, which are really important, there's all, you know, we have rules as to how we should use data, data protection laws. We've got rules for ethics and compliance you know, to make sure we use data well. We've got a technology, the blockchains and open, API, or open APIs and all those different bits of technology we need to use. And we've got organisations which help us look after data. That organisation might be the Open Data Institute, it might be each of you. you know, each of you are probably helping maintain financial data infrastructure, build and maintain it. If you've got a bank account, your data's in that infrastructure. So data infrastructure, it is about technology operation, organisations and processes, it's, it's, as well as the data, so it's not just the data. We also talk about sectors, so data infrastructure. You know, this session is about financial data infrastructure, but data infrastructure actually cuts across lots of sectors. So the mortgage product information held and maintained by banks, you know, that's used by the banks, it's used by regulators, it's used by customers to make decisions, it's used by lots of different people. The property ownership records held by the UK's land registry, when we were looking at the land registry, we found that those property ownership records actually form part of credit reference data, which is used by banks when offering products to customers and understand the risk in their portfolios. The maps in our country are cutting across lots of different sectors. We have uh, flood maps, 
as well. So flood maps are made available, and they're used to help price insurance in different markets. So that data infrastructure cuts across lots of different sectors. So that financial data infrastructure is really important. It's using data from the finance sector, but also it's using data from other sector, and the data it publishes is used by other sectors. And what we're finding at the moment is that the Open Data Institute, you know, we, we say data is infrastructure, but we say actually sometimes it's not really good data infrastructure. There's too much data which is actually poor quality. It might be we've not got a good set of open identifiers for it. It might be that it's inaccessible because it's locked away behind a paywall and I can't afford to get to it. You know, it might be the data's inaccessible entirely because no one's ever collected the, uh, the stamp for each diamond, which I would love to see that stamp for each diamond because that data has just never been collected before and pulled together and made usable. So we say there's lots of problems with it. So we talk about what kind of data infrastructure are we building for the future. So we think about three futures. And we said there's three futures we've got in front of us, and it's really important that we think about those futures and we, we choose which future we want to build. It's all of us, each of us, our organisations, our governments, our societies. Different societies might make different choices who are choosing those futures. There's a, there's a lockdown future, or the closed future on here. If I put it on roads, it's got lots of barbed wire on it. It's got lots of missing roads. We end up in that future where people get worried about what's happening with their data because we've misused it. You know, all, all of us building services, we've used it really badly, so people start to withdraw their services. Or we've had too many privacy hacks and scares and security breaches. People withdraw, that might lead us to the lockdown future, you know, where we don't have, we've got missing rows, we've got locked walls and barbed gates and barbed wire. There's another one, the paid future. That's a future where we expect to get paid for, date, for data. And we think all data should have a price tag. We think the value's in the data rather than in the service that's just built from the data. So we put price tags on it. We even might put, start selling our personal data. I might say in Google, I'll let you know where I am today, but only for 5p. But when you start to think about that future, some people say it's quite attractive, but when you think about it, the actual the cost of all those transactions and licensing and data brokering, it starts to hinder innovation. It slows things down. In, in our road analogies, we think of it as a, a road network full of toll booths every 100 yards. You know, that'd be quite painful to work its way around. And then there's a third future, the open future. The open future actually looks much like our current road network. It's kind of what we learned to build. You know, the roads are as navigable and open as possible. As much data as possible is open, but we respect privacy. So we respect privacy. Other than that, we get as much open data as possible. And that creates the most value. When you look at it, when you look at all the evidence we've been producing over the years, that's the one that creates the most value, gets the best services. It creates a virtuous circle of benefits. And it's really important. Because yeah, when we look at these things, we might say, cool, we need to build these things like roads. We're going to learn how we did roads. So I looked up recently uh, how long it took us to build the M25. It was 49 years after first proposing the M25 before it was finished. You know, it was in a book by Lutyens, the great architect. He was one of the first people to propose it, but it took 49 years to get it finished. And the web of data is moving quite fast, really. You know, just in a few years, I think it's 25 years. How long is it Tim, since Tim Berners-Lee created the web? 25 years. You know, look at what we've done already. All these stats about how much data is flowing around, all these services we're using, the fact we, we can say we arrived here because of City Mapper, and I, I did the same. I got here by looking at all my options on City Mapper and then asking around the office for humans to help me, because that would actually turn out to be the best answer. We've got the web of data coming, and what's going to be happening over the next few years is massive change. And that web of data is being built right now, so it's important we think about those futures. Because we can't wait for to nine years, we've got to kind of start building now. If we don't do it, somebody else will. So one of the things, we've been doing at the ODI is we've been working with sectors and different groups like the finance sector, like the agriculture sector, to start saying, what does your data infrastructure need? What do you want? How do we work together to build it? How do we actually get communities to work together to build that? So one of the things that a lot of people worked on last year was the open banking standard. So the open banking standard, it was 150 people over three months, umpteen different organisations, challenger banks, fin no, challenger banks, fintech, data aggregators, large banks, uh, regulators, trade bodies, the ODI in the corner, waving a lot of flag. Yeah, we did that. We waved a lot of flags in the corner. But brought together to build this document and start to say, how can we build a data infrastructure which is as open as possible for retail banking? So a great big document, and then a shorter document, which actually Anna over there in the front row did a great job in producing and cutting down, to say, how do we make it also as accessible to as many people as possible? Because mm -hmm. if we're going to be changing banking data, we want to make sure the customers know. We want to make sure as many people as possible know so they get a chance to feedback and they're they're comfortable with what we're doing with their data. In the open banking standard, it's 
you know, building that thing, it's not just about creating data, it's about you know, understanding user needs, it's about building APIs and sandboxes, it's about running innovation challenges to stimulate the market, it's about comms with all of our customers, it's about compliance and guidance. Those are things we need to do to build those kind of standards and make them get them used in actually building better services. But there's really good possibilities there, because it sounds like it could be quite hard, you know. Is that really worth it? Is it just another big standards document we're going to produce and put on the shelf like all the other ones? So, and it is worth it, because again, we look at those things, we say it's unlocking open innovation. It's creating open innovation in an environment where people trust what's being done to their data. You know, it will help people have fintech apps which can manage multiple bank accounts. It will help customers compare bank accounts. It will help banks offer new products to customers and understand their needs and what they want and communicate out to the market. One of the examples I had was uh, the UK's identity management system, Verify. They came along and said that data could help us handle decentralised identity if we could get access to it in a privacy-conscious and customer-controlled way. The, there was somebody came over to us from France and said, if I had access to UK banking data, I could help people move into France to get an apartment or to open up a bank account because I can make it easy for that data to flow around and I can give them identity in different places. So there's lots of possibilities if you get the open innovation. And we open up that data, we make that data as open as possible. And if we do that from the financial sector and those other sectors, but we build it by doing things, we build it by building standards, by getting them used, and things like the open banking standard is one way to do that. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. I think I'm on time. Thank <laughs> you.